So we'll start with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to dig into your word together. Bless us that it opens our eyes to see opportunities to, to be your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So this is the one that was recommended by um, the Everyone Outreach Seminar. Uh, so they encourage you know, each year to do, do one of the studies that has to do with outreach and encourages outreach. And I thought this time of year would be great as we had so many visitors on Easter and we'll be gearing up for all the summer things. Uh, and we're starting canvassing up again. Um, so a great opportunity to, to start thinking about some of these things. Um, and so this one is, if you remember one by one, we did two years ago. That was the one where we watched uh, Pastor Rosenau's keynote address and it broke it up with questions about it. Uh, this is a similar video style um, Bible study where we'll watch a little bit and then we will um, have some questions about it. And we're gonna we're gonna pair and share. So uh, um, let's see. If well, we'll see as people come in, we might have to. We'll uh, um, if if someone comes in and you're sitting by yourself, say, "Hey, come sit by me." All right. So like Mitch, you can practice right now. Yeah. Greg, Mitch needs a partner. So if you're if you're willing to sacrifice for the good of and sit by him, that'd be good. All right. Is that loud enough or not? Is that loud Welcome to In Season and Out of Season, a Bible study in which we're going to talk about being prepared and confident to share our faith in Jesus whenever and wherever God has placed us. I'm very happy you're here. My name is Pastor Eric Recker, and we're going to get started by sharing some of our own thoughts and feelings about evangelism in general. I think Christians often feel like they're on an island, like they're the only ones who feel the way they feel about evangelism, or maybe some of the fears and concerns they have about it. So the first thing I'd like to ask you to do is answer the question, what made you interested in joining this Bible study? And just share that with the folks around you. Take a few minutes to do that. Okay, so we're going to pair and share. So each table, you are sharing with the others on your table. Joseph, you want to turn around and share you and David be a team there? <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. All right, so th this these first couple are just kind of practicing. Uh, so uh, each each person in the, in the pair or three, uh, share share your thoughts on it. Ready, set, go. You have one minute, and then I'll ask you to share them with me. <laughs> All right. Uh, share what the their partner said. Joseph, uh, either what you said or what your partner said, something well, interesting. One thing is, is, he said that uh, they went to church this morning, something that they knew after church. There you go. I like it. And, uh, I said, when you went to what I said, oh, he said, uh, <laughs> I said, well, my wife got this morning said we're going to Bible study, and also she learned. There you go. <laughs> Anyone have anything else that, uh, any other reasons that you or your partner came up with? Those two reasons were the reasons for everybody here? So learning about God. Learning about God, I like it. Okay, to more boldly share the gospel, awesome. Thanks for sharing your thoughts uh, on why you joined this Bible study. 
The next thing I'd like to ask you to do is just to quickly uh, share with one another at least one goal that you have for this study. Take a moment to do that. Please. All right, ready, set, go. One goal you have. What do you want to get out of this study? All right. Said how to better to learn how to better share. Uh, excellent. Any others? Yeah, Melissa? To learn more about people without fear. Okay, without fear, David. Awesome. That's Carolson. All right. You're winning. All right. Yeah, four points for the back table. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing. You know, if you ask people, Christians in general, their thoughts on evangelism, it's not uncommon. In fact, it's uh, extremely common. Or the person to say that they're afraid of something when it comes to evangelism, or they're afraid of a number of uh, aspects of evangelism. So what I'd like you to do next is just with the folks around you, share your greatest fear about evangelism. Take Ready, a moment. Set, Let's see, can we, can we get a partner for Daniel over here? Uh, David, you want to be Daniel's partner? So David's taking the points from that table with him over there. Welcome back. Yep. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, hopefully, as you just... Yeah, quiet. Okay. That must mean you're done. Um, who will share what you came up with? Greatest fear. Patty. Oh, Vicki. Okay. What if I don't know what to say? What if I don't know the answer? Okay. Yeah. I, I don't like talking in front of people. Okay. I think no is not being able to reach or missing an opportunity to reach out to someone. Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good fear, right? I, I don't want to miss the opportunity that got put in front of us. Um, in reaction to the others, you don't understand. Some people get offended. Okay. What if I offend someone? Yeah. Yeah. I said uh, fear of a door slam. Okay. Door slam. Uh, I've had door slam in my face, but never on my face. So that would, uh, yeah, <laughs> that might be worse. <laughs> A fear of heights. So if you happen to be sharing your faith on a mountaintop um, or look overlooking a cliff, that would be scary. Okay. Okay. Even scarier, be mocked or rejected. Awesome. All right. Let's keep going then. We'll come back to those. Welcome back and thanks so much for sharing. Uh, hopefully, as you discussed your greatest fear about evangelism, you found out that you're not alone. Uh, that there are others who have fears, and maybe they have the same fear that you do. Our prayer is that during this study, we maybe can alleviate some of those fears, gain some confidence from God's word as we share our faith. Next, let's talk a little bit about the goals of, of the, the entire study, some things that we hope uh, we will gain from it. First of all, that we appreciate both the privilege and responsibility of telling others about Jesus, and really both of those are true. What a privilege that we have such great news to tell others, but also that it's a responsibility Jesus has given us. Secondly, to understand what evangelism is, that might sound simplistic, and in fact, in this first lesson, uh, we're going to go over some things that are pretty basic, but we want to make sure that we're all on the same page and understanding what we're talking about when we use that term evangelism. The third thing that, the third goal that we have is learning to intentionalize our efforts. Uh, it, it seems to me in my conversations with Christians that if they do share their faith in Jesus, many times it's sort of accidental. And what we hope to do is be more intentional about it. That's number three. Number four, um, learn to prepare for and also look for evangelism opportunities. 
if uh, if if we're just waiting for it to happen, um, it, it might not. But if we're looking for opportunities and it's part of our everyday life, you'll be uh, shocked, amazed, and pleased with the doors the Lord will open. And then a fifth goal of our study is that you become more confident in your evangelism. And the key to that really is, uh, or one of the main keys anyway, is to understand what our role is in evangelism and what God's role is. And that second part, what God's role is, is, is going to give us great confidence as we go about this. So those are the goals for our uh, three-week study or three-lesson study. Let's talk about our goals just for this study today. Two goals. First, to appreciate the privilege and responsibility of evangelism, as we talked about earlier. And then secondly, understanding what evangelism is. So with that, let's go ahead and dig in and uh, answer this question. Who would you say is the greatest evangelist of all time? Who, who comes to your mind? Now, I'm going to guess that for many of you, the name that came to mind is that of St. Paul, the evangelist. And it's not surprising when you think of all that, that St. Paul did. Um, let's just talk about some of the some of the truths of uh, some of the things that he did. Uh, first of all, he had three major missionary journeys that, that are recorded in the scripture. Probably he had four because he alludes to a trip in which he went all the way to Spain. But, but three major missionary journeys, of course, that are um, recorded for us in the book of Acts. He founded dozens of Christian congregations in Asia Minor and in, in, in uh, what is now Greece and uh, possibly as far as Spain, dozens of congregations. He was instrumental in taking the gospel to the Gentiles. If you remember, uh, Peter and the other apostles were spreading the word rapidly among the Jewish uh, people of the world. But Paul, boy, he took it to another level with the Gentiles. He also wrote 13 books of the New Testament, uh, certainly a, a, an important part of our faith because uh, of what he tells us in those books. And then if you look at what he was willing to suffer for the sake of evangelism, he records that in the New Testament, the, the number of times that he was arrested, uh, beaten, uh, left for dead at one point, shipwrecked. Uh, he was so passionate to tell others about Jesus, he was willing to suffer all of these things. And then finally, of course, uh, history tells us that, that Paul was martyred for his faith and, and was willing to die for it. So you add all of those things up, it's, it's hard to make a case that someone was a greater evangelist than St. Paul. What's interesting about him being that great of an evangelist is that he was unbelievably unlikely as an evangelist. Um, what would you say made St. Paul such an unlikely evangelist? Just take a moment to think about that and talk about it with those around you. All right, David, you want to hit the lights? And uh, start talking in your partner or your group. Uh, what did you come up with? He killed Christians. He killed Christians. That would make him an unlikely guy to make people be Christians. He persecuted the church. Persecuted the church. And because of those things, that could have given him a reputation that would scare people away from him. Okay. Not want to listen to him. Yeah. Christians certainly wouldn't want to work with him. And yeah. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Excuse me. All right. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts on what made Paul such an unexpected evangelist. Uh, he himself tells us in the New Testament why he's 
pretty much the last, the last person you would expect to be a Christian evangelist. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul wrote, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. And he tells us why, because I persecuted the church of God. Um, you might remember some of the things he did to persecute the church of God. Now, if you were going to, if you were God, if you were Jesus and you said, I'm going to, I'm going to pick someone out to spread my message around the world. Hmm, the first person I'm going to pick is Paul. Yep. He's the one I'm going to pick because he's the one persecuting my church. He's stopping the gospel from being spread. That's not very likely. But listen to what Paul says, or what the New Testament says he was doing. Acts chapter 7, for example, uh, chapter 7 and going into, into chapter 8. If you remember, St. Stephen was uh, a deacon in the early Christian church. And he was arrested for his faith. And then he stood before the Jewish Sanhedrin and gave a confession there. And they became so angry at him for what he said that they took him outside the city gates to stone him. And then we're told this, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord, Lord Jesus, uh, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And then we're told this, when he had said this, he fell asleep and Saul was there giving approval to his death. Remember, Paul's name originally was Saul. And so there was Stephen, a hero of the early Christian church, being stoned for nothing other than telling others about his faith. And as he dies, Paul is there, and he's giving approval to it. Again, not someone you would normally say would be an evangelist. And then we're told after that happened, after um, Stephen was stoned, that on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So here's this man who approved of Stephen's death and then goes around arresting Christians and throwing them into prison. But that's not all. In Acts chapter 9, we're told that Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Paul was so angry at the Christian church. He was so convinced that they were wrong and that they were actually harming God's people that he wasn't satisfied with just arresting people and putting people to death in Jerusalem. He went to the high priest and said, could I get uh, a letter that I could take to the synagogues in Damascus and round up Christians there? So Paul was a persecutor of persecutors, and that was sort of his personality. If he was going to do something, he was going to do it to the nth degree. In this case, sadly, it was persecuting Christians. So the question then is, if Paul was such an unlikely evangelist, how did he become one? Take right. a moment and talk with those around you. And see if you can remember the answer to that question. Go for it. You got a minute to figure it out. All right, I heard a few things. Well, sir, were you picking up? Were you raising your hand or no? You are? Okay, the power of God. Yeah. Okay, God chose him. God changed his heart. God changed his heart. Yeah. He said now he's a vegetarian. <laughs> and now he's a vegetarian. <laughs> well, I think about when when Peter was called to the Gentiles, it was exactly the opposite of vegetarianism that uh, that was part of that call. But uh, okay, welcome back, and thank you for uh, for sharing your thoughts uh, of how Paul became an evangelist. Uh, the event of his conversion is recorded in Acts chapter 9, and we're told this, as Paul neared Damascus on his journey, remember, he's going there to persecute Christians. 
Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So the way Paul became an evangelist is just divine intervention. He's on his way to persecute Christians. Jesus appears to him, blinding light on the way there. And Jesus says, this isn't going to happen anymore. And of course, the rest of the story, Paul goes into Damascus and uh, Ananias comes and speaks with him, baptizes him, and Paul becomes a Christian. So the way that Paul became an evangelist is uh, just by divine intervention. The next question I'd like you to think about is, if Paul was such an unlikely evangelist, I mean, he's persecuting the church, putting people to death, why did Jesus choose Paul to serve as an evangelist? All right, moment and just discuss that. 30 seconds, come up with an answer in your group. Why did Jesus do it? You ready to answer it, Joseph? What do you got? I feel like God, you know, he saw the determination, you know, his determination to persecute Christians was so great that he knew that if he could turn this man, or knew he was a man, then, then, you know, what, it would be like if I was a king and I said, okay, I put this, get this guy on our side. What would you do? Okay. So it's just how you get the guy to our side, but of course that's, that's God's work. Yeah. So Paul was certainly diligent and vehement, although I may push back a little bit and say, um, but it wasn't really something in Saul or Paul that was the, the reason for it, other than, well, I'll, I don't want to steal other thunder. What uh, what other reasons did you come up with? By showing mercy and pouring grace out of it. So showing mercy, so and Paul will actually make that point, saying, uh, um, this is why he did it, is so that everyone could see if God can work with something like this, the God is merciful, right? Um, if, if God loved me, boy, is God merciful. Um, awesome. What other answers did you come up with? The scripture passage in Timothy says, um, I show mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Okay. So that I will be a learning experience. Okay. I had that flash of light. Yeah. You know, was part of the power of God to. You know, out out of darkness life. into his wonderful light. Yeah, yeah, that, that mercy that said, well, that's not going to work for you, son. Um, I'm going to change that. Awesome. Oh, cool. Welcome back. Thank you for sharing and discussing if Paul was such an unlikely evangelist, then why did Jesus choose him to be his evangelist? Well, Paul himself tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. He says, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. That word grace is so important. Of course, it means the undeserved love of God. And that is Paul's point. He says, I wasn't chosen to be an evangelist because I deserved it or I had earned it. It was just purely God's grace and his love for me. And then he says, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So one reason that Paul was chosen is just by God's grace, nothing in him at all. But then he also tells us, as he goes on, he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. That's an interesting phrase Paul uses there, I am the worst. What he's saying is, if you line up all the sinners in the history of the world, I'm at the front of the line. I'm the worst one, specifically because I'm the one who was killing Christians and putting them in prison. But for that very reason, he says, I was shown mercy. And that word mercy is an important one. It has the idea of feeling sorry for someone, someone who's helpless, who's hopeless. 
It's that feeling you get when you're watching a commercial on TV or uh, a, a charity that helps abused animals and you see those puppy faces and it's so sad and they're crying and they're abused and your heart goes out to them. Paul says, that's how God felt toward me. It wasn't anything in me that earned or deserved it. It was just because he pitied me. Paul says, for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Did you catch Paul's point there? Paul says, I was the, the last person on earth that you would expect Jesus to choose to be his evangelist. But do you know why he did it? He chose me so that when I did evangelize other people, none of them could say, well, God can't save me. There's no way he could be merciful to me. If he was merciful to Paul, if he had grace on Paul, then cer certainly he would anyone else. So although unexpected as an evangelist, Paul was the perfect choice as Jesus evangelist. And that's why Paul was so passionate about evangelism. Um, he knew how much God had done for him. He knew how undeserving he was of God's love, God's forgiveness. And he just couldn't wait to tell other people that God felt the same way about them, that he had also forgiven them. And Paul, of course, even pointed out that his unworthiness made him that much uh, more of an evangelist, a stronger of an evangelist in a certain sense. So let's talk a little bit about you. What about you? Why would you not naturally or normally uh, be Jesus' first choice to serve as an evangelist? Take a moment and just discuss that with the folks around you. All right, so we're doing pairs. Um, so Lisa and Eliane, if you want to be a pair, uh, come up with an answer and then and then we'll, we'll share with the group. So take about uh, 30 seconds to a minute. Why would you not naturally um, be Jesus' first choice to be an evangelist? Ready, set, go. I went to the front. Yeah. Chris, if you want to come up and be Kim's uh, teammate here, we're talking about. Um, why? So we talked about Paul, and how he was a very unlikely evangelist, right? A persecutor in the church. And now the question is, why would why would we be unlikely to be the ones Jesus would say, "Hey, I want you to go represent me." Um, so that's what that's the question that's on the on the screen right now. So what you guys come up with? Why why are you an unlikely evangelist? You're all very like what's that? Okay, so we each of us lack perfect knowledge, right? We don't know everything. You certainly know you know the basics, right? You you know uh, what Jesus has done, but yeah, that could be one reason. I'm unlikely because boy, I don't know as much as you know the professors. Joseph, I'm a sinner. Yeah, uh, why would he want someone who messes up? To be represented, he could send the perfect angels, uh, but I'm a sinner. What else did you come up with? Okay, yeah, because I'm too young, or I'm too old, or I'm too whatever. Yeah, we can find lots of reasons. Any others? Okay, well, then we'll come back to the video. Welcome back. Thank you for chatting about that for a bit. Let's look at what the Bible says about why you and I would be the last people uh, you would think God would want as evangelists. St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one, which means we're all lumped together, right? We're all sinful, 
rebels against God. Um, day in and day out, we disappoint him. We disobey him. So you wouldn't expect people like us to be chosen by him to be evangelists. So then why did Jesus choose you to serve as his evangelist? Well, really for the same reason that he chose St. Paul. Let's look at, at some passages. In Titus 3, Paul says, he saved us not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. The only reason that you and I have this incredible privilege of being evangelists and telling others about Jesus, the only reason is because he took pity on us and had mercy on us. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about what motivates us, what compels us to be his witnesses. Paul writes, for Christ's love compels us. When we think about his love for us and what he was willing to do for us, it just pushes us to want to tell others about him. He says, Christ's love compel compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. What an awesome phrase that is. First of all, Paul says it's Christ's love that motivates us. And then secondly, he says we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. And what's the job of an ambassador? What's the job of an ambassador? Ambassador goes out on behalf of a government or a king and simply tells them the king's message. That's all that we're commanded to do as well. It's not our job to come up with a new message. It's our job to share his message. So as you think about these realities of um, why we are unexpected evangelists, but why it is that God has called us to be his evangelists, as you think about that, um, what fears about evangelism do those realities address? Take a few minutes and uh, talk about that with those around you. All right. So talk about what, what he just talked about. How does that address the fears we brought up earlier? What fears might evangelism do those realities address? Ready, set, go. All right. You get two minutes this time. And I'm going to Okay, what you come up with? Who will share? What fears does that address? What's that? Whether or not we're worthy? How so? How does that address that? Okay. Yeah, he made us worthy. Excellent. Yeah. Right. Awesome. What else? What other fears? Those passages address. I say God's word gives us confidence to speak for him. Okay. Yeah, I'm speaking for him. I'm not speaking for myself, which removes all those fears of, well, what if I, yeah, yeah. Excellent. What else? None of us have perfect knowledge. Okay. Yeah, but God is perfect, right? He's given us his word. So uh, so I, I don't have to be afraid of not having perfect knowledge. Excellent. That Christ's love compels us. Okay. So, 
whatever those fears are, let them go. We're compelled by Christ. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Compelled by Christ and made made perfect by Christ, right? You know, so that whole thing of, uh, well, I'm a sinner, so I shouldn't really be telling other people. They're just going to call me a hypocrite. Well, um, we're all sinners, and we we need this. And if I realize what Christ has done for me, I want to share that. I don't want someone else to to suffer because they don't know that. I think a lot of times we focus on our earthly view of ourselves and. Okay. The critical view of ourselves <laughs> yep. we all have self-esteem issues and mm. find things wrong with ourselves but we need to look at what does god say about us because yeah. my view is always going to be tainted by sin right god's view of me praise the lord is that i'm a child of god he loves me yeah. he forgives me you know so that's what matters yeah don't get caught up in what your own view of yourself is but focus on what he says, yeah. you know, and then you'll feel more confident and comfortable and realize that none of that matters. That's just that simple chatter yeah. in your head. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That, that is awesome. That's such a huge piece of being able to be those ambassadors that God has made us because um, one, it like, like you were so beautifully describing it, it takes care of the motivation. Um, look at what he has done. So I, I want to share this. And two, it gets, it gets us out of our heads when it comes to the the act or the the results of it, right? Um, we went canvassing, and no one came to church that Sunday from canvassing. Um, we must really stink. Let's not do it anymore. Uh, no, it's God's work, and He's He's handling all of that. Uh, he's given us the privilege of of going to do that. Or the flip side, hey, we went canvassing and. Five families came from that canvassing visit, and then then they joined BIC, and then they they uh, became members, and they got baptized, and it was awesome. Look at how good we are. No, um, look at how good God is. Uh, awesome. Uh, well said, Becca. Any other thoughts on that one? All right, then we will keep going. Welcome back, and thank you for sharing uh, some of the fears that the truths we just learned address. Here are some that came to my mind. If someone were to say, um, I don't deserve to tell others. Um, well, as we just learned, no, you don't. And I don't either. St. Paul certainly didn't. But it's not about deserving to tell others. It's the privilege of telling others because Jesus has forgiven those sins and allowed us to. Or how about this? Someone who says, I don't know enough to tell others. That's a very common one. Uh, people are terrified that they're they don't know their Bible well enough. Well, that may be true uh, that, that, that we could all know our Bible better. But if you think about it, there's only a few things we really need to know. One is that I'm a sinner, uh, just like the people around me. Uh, secondly, I'm forgiven in Christ. Uh, thirdly, that the people I'm talking to are sinners just like me. And fourthly, Jesus died for their sins too. That's really what we need to know. How about this? Uh, someone who says, I'm a sinner too, so who am I to tell people how to live? Now, that, that statement, uh, which is fairly common, has a couple of problems with it. First of all, I'm a sinner too. As we just said, um, yes, you are. Um, but that doesn't mean you wouldn't tell someone else. It makes me think of a, a couple that I was talking to years ago. And they were, they were talking about their son, who was, I think, about 18 or 19 years old at the time. And they were concerned because their son was starting to smoke cigarettes. And I remember the father saying, well, you know, I would like to tell him to stop, but I can't because I used to smoke when I was young. And I thought, what an, what an interesting way of thinking about that. So something that, that you did, but that you recognize was harmful, you're not going to stop him because you did it. I mean, if, if the only people who could tell other people about Jesus are those who aren't sinners, no one could tell people about Jesus. So that's the first issue with that one. But then look at the second part of that statement. Who am I to tell people how to live? If you think that evangelism means telling other people how to live, and that's the primary goal of it, well, then it's good you're here because we're going to talk about what evangelism is in a moment. And certainly God has guides, guidelines for our lives and how he wants us to live. But Evangelism is not primarily about telling other people how to live. We'll talk about that more in just a bit. And how about one more? Um, 
the, the fear that the person you're thinking of uh, could never be brought to faith. They're just too far gone. They're too much of, they're too sinful or they're too um, angry at the church or they're too um, much of an atheist or an agnostic, who knows, uh, but that person could never be brought to faith. I suppose people probably would have said that about St. Paul before he was converted, wouldn't they? You know, if there's anyone who couldn't be brought to faith, it would have been Saul of Tarsus who was arresting Christians and putting them in prison. And it just shows us that there is no one God can't bring to faith in Christ. And whoever you're thinking of, uh, who seems like an impossibility, uh, what we just learned about St. Paul can be an encouragement to you. So having talked about some of the fears that we can overcome with these truths, let's switch gears a little bit and, and, and talk just in general about what evangelism is. Because as I just mentioned, if, if you think that evangelism is telling other people how to live, then we're misunderstanding what it is. Um, and we really don't want to go any further in this study without clearly understanding what we mean by evangelism. So uh, take a moment, either jot down on, on your study guide or discuss with your group. Uh, a definition of evangelism. Take a moment to do that, please. All right, you get one minute to come up with your group's best definition of evangelism. Let me step forward. All right, you got quiet. That must mean you all have your answers. Who will share? Joseph? Pray God, yeah, Lord, encourage to, to hear God's word and to stay in God's word. Okay, spreading God's word, encourage to hear God's word and stay in God's word. Cheryl? Sharing the joy of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sharing the joy of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Awesome. Anyone else want to share? I think we got two great examples of a definition there, and he's going to agree. Father Lord. Welcome back, and uh, thank you for defining evangelism. Let's break this down a little bit. The word evangelism comes from a Greek word, oiangelion, uh, and that word means good news. Oi means good. Angelion, which is the word we get, uh, the, word, the English word angel from, means message, so a good message. So evangelism is the telling of good news. So the, the obvious question then is, what is the good news? Now, I realize that you might very well know what the good news is, but we still want to break it down and define it to be clear on what it is that we're sharing. Notice, by the way, it's the sharing of good news. It's not primarily telling other people how to live their lives. So what is the good news that we have to tell? Take a moment and again, either jot this down on your study guide okay, or this discuss one, it in your group. Each person, you get 30 seconds to share the gospel, to speak what it is, that is the good news, which is sometimes it might be really easy. I might be like, oh, what do I want to include in this? You only have 30 seconds. So first group, take 30 seconds. I'll tell you when your time's up and then your partner is going to respond and give you their definition. So person A, ready, set, go. Yeah. Okay, person B, I'm going to up the ante a little bit here. You just came upon a car crash, and the person has 30 seconds of consciousness before they die. You have 30 seconds to tell them what they need to know. Ready, set, go. So whoever wasn't talking before is talking now. All right, who wants to share? 
Who will share? Who is willing? Cheryl. Uh, what I say to the dying person is, yep. um, uh, do not be afraid. If you put your faith in Christ, you will join him at the Lord's table. Okay. So pointing to that surety of heaven. How? How does that work? Who will share? What'd you say? Christ died for us. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes except through him. Awesome. Jesus loves you. He forgives your sins. He loves you. He forgives your sins. Given if you believe in him. Awesome. Anyone add anything? Yeah. <laughs> right? Right? Okay. Let's uh let's see what he says. As specific as you can in, in one sentence. What is the good news we have to tell? Welcome back, and thank you for jotting down or discussing your definition of evangelism. Uh, we're, we're asking ourselves, what is the good news that we have to tell? Well, already in Luke chapter 2, uh, as, as the, angel is, the angel is talking to the shepherds the night that Jesus was born, listen to what the angel said. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. So right there in the Christmas story, that well-known Christmas story, the angel lays it right out. I'm bringing you good news. It's for all people. And do you know what that good news is? A Savior has been born to you. And, and come to think of it, if you didn't know any other Bible passages, that well-known passage is maybe all you would need to share Jesus with other people. So the good news is that a savior has been born to you now. Next question. What is it that he has come to save us from? And again, perhaps this, this is basic information, something you've known your whole life, but it needs to be asked because there are plenty of people in our world who think that if Jesus is a savior, he's come to save us from, uh, from, from uh, all kinds of things that God hasn't promised. But if we listen to the, the angel speaking to uh, St. Uh, Joseph, uh, telling him about the coming birth of, of uh, Mary's son, here's what the angel said. Mary will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So we're sharing good news that there's a savior, and the angel says, here's, the good, here's what he's saving people from saving people from their sins. That name Jesus is, of course, the Greek way of saying the Old Testament name of Yeshua or Joshua, which, which means savior or deliverer. So the good news that we have a savior and that he will save people from their sins. And as a result of it, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So let's see if we can take all of those different aspects and put it together into a single sentence to define what evangelism is. Here's what I'm going to propose. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that Jesus has saved us from our sins and gives us eternal life in heaven. That's it. That is uh, the gospel. And that's the good news we have to share. So back to what evangelism is. Evangelism is connecting people to the gospel, somehow getting them in contact with that good news of what Jesus has done for them. Or we could perhaps say a little bit more narrowly, we usually think of evangelism as connecting people who don't know the good news to the gospel. Um, I tell my, my, uh, my children about the good news, but since they're already believers, we usually don't refer to that as evangelism. We're especially talking about those people who don't yet know it. So the next question is, how do we do this? And it's a huge question. We could, we could spend dozens of lessons talking about different aspects of evangelism. But can I suggest we just break it down to two ways of connecting people to the gospel? Um, the two ways are either by invitation 
or proclamation. So I'll just assume you know someone, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a, a family member who doesn't know the good news. Uh, one way to connect them to it is just to invite them. And it might be inviting them to church for a worship service. It might be inviting them to a, a Bible class, especially a Bible information class where they are introduced to him, but somehow inviting them to a place where they will hear the gospel. That's one possibility, certainly a valid one. The second way to connect them to the gospel is by proclamation. And this is when you personally proclaim the good news to them. So the question is, which is better? Take a moment and discuss that with those around you. Is invitation or proclamation a better way to connect people to the gospel? All right. 30 seconds, come up with an answer. Yeah, please. <laughs> Uh, who will share what you discussed? Both? Okay, that's always a safe answer, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't cover her. So, you know, depends on depends on where they're at, what the situation is. She said the person in the car accident, you're not gonna say, hey, come to my church. You're gonna you're gonna proclaim. So the situation might di dictate, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. If you're not in an extenuating circumstance and limitations, because if you're not real sure of, of scripture to back up what you're saying, or, or if you're not familiar enough with revival at all, or you're just new to the gospel. Sometimes it's better for invitation because a trained vicar or a, a pastor is going to be obviously more well versed to answer any questions about the gospel. So invitation could be better. Okay, so making some points for invitation. Uh, anyone want to take the other side of that um, and, and say, well, but wait a second, what about this, Kim? I would say some people are not comfortable in going or they just don't know them. Okay. So in that case, you might just want to. Okay, so the person might not be ready to actually show up. And the first step would be the proclaiming. Good. And and yet what Cheryl says has some, you know, all right, I'm a little nervous. I don't know how well I'm going to proclaim. I think he made a good point. You know, you know. It's a seed. Right. You're planting a seed. Yeah, even if it's as simple as Jesus is our savior, right? He 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 died for our sins. We get to go to heaven. Um, how about that idea that the pastor or the vicar would be a better person to proclaim to them than you? There may be a situation where that's true. I'd argue, I think that's less like less often true than not. Why? It's my experience that people responded because they're like me. They, okay. You know, they have a job and a family and do the little league and all the same things as me. And so they tend to, in my experience, we would have responded more to that okay. than you yeah. know, uh, experienced training. Okay. You know, and then some, some people have the idea that, okay, I got to tell the pastor whatever he wants to hear and end this conversation as soon as possible, right? Whereas if you're talking to your friend, um, that conversation is, okay, I, they're more ready to hear. Now, there are some situations, and, and I love it when you're talking to your friend and you're talking about stuff, and, and you get to the point where they're they're ready to say, okay, now I've got some questions because of what you just told me. Um, where can I get those questions answered? Hey, let's call pastor. That's awesome, because then they're ready and they're not saying, yeah, no thanks. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, it's the the thing you get on the airplane and and uh, within 
you know, hey, and what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, sorry about my language before. Or, right. oh, sorry, you know, it's like, oh, I got to be this different person in front of the pastor. Um, no, I'm, I'm a sinner just like you are and, and all of that. But God has has put each of us, you know, you think about that, that priesthood of all believers, right? That God has put us in very different situations from one another so that we can be the person for that person where they need it. You know, I, I, I love it going canvassing. Um, and if I'm, I'm with someone and, and the person at the door says, uh, uh, you know what, I, I grew up Baptist and, and whatever else, or I grew up this, and it's happened a bunch of times where the person I'm with is like, oh, that's what I used to be. Uh, let me explain to you why, you know, and so all of a sudden, oh, you know where I'm coming from, right? Whereas, you know, I was baptized Lutheran at eight days old, right? I mean, I've, I've this is what I've, I've studied all the other stuff, but, um, or, you know, someone saying, hey, I'm dealing with that uh, uh, understanding of religion as it's all obedience and I got to be good enough and, and the frustration of that. Someone who's, who's really been through that, through a religion that, that was all about that, boy, they are perfectly equipped to have that conversation and ease those fears. So, so great point, but I think you can make just as strong a points on, on both sides of it. Um, which makes it a good question, right? It gets you talking about it and thinking about this. Um, and we are out of time. So next time, so next week, Vicar will do his uh, series that he's doing. And then the following week, I'll be teaching this again. We'll finish up this one and we'll start in on, on lesson two as we get to talk more about evangelism. So let's, let's close with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be your witnesses. We don't deserve it. But in your great mercy, you use us. We ask that you do that powerfully, that everyone may see how great you are. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.